<laughs> now, uh, two things are happening uh, in the world today um, as a result of this crisis. First, I think we all agree there's a mood of distrust, in fact a mood of extreme distrust that's emerging towards liberal economic systems and towards globalized markets generally. We see it in the developed world, even in the states where commitment to free markets has been generally much stronger than Europe, even in the states where the problems arose, the problems that led to this crisis arose, but also in the developing world where the problems were received and received in a in a sudden and uh, highly accentuated form. The developing countries have in the last six to eight months gone through a very rough patch of a sudden collapse in markets for their goods, sudden withdrawal of credit, a sudden stop in liquidity in several instances. So it's been a rough time and you can understand the distrust that's emerged towards globalization, towards open markets, towards liberalization as a domestic agenda in these economies. At the end of the G20 meeting, I was listening to Gordon Brown give his press conference and he pronounced with a certain air of triumph the end of the Washington Consensus. What is less clear, and in fact is most unclear, is what the alternative is. There has been no coherent exposition of an alternative to what is called the Washington Consensus. That's the first thing that's happened, a mood of distrust. The second thing that's happening is a sudden new faith in policy activism. There's been this dramatic rebalancing because of this crisis between markets and the state. It's been accepted across the political spectrum. It's not just social democrats and or the democrats in the US, it's more or less across the spectrum of public opinion. Because people fear the alternative. They fear the alternative of the government not stepping in, injecting substantial fiscal stimulus and rescuing large institutions, particularly large banks. They fear the cascading of uh, the collapse across more markets than just the financial industry. And they fear the social consequences of that. So this new faith in policy activism is again a new thing. It's, it's a second new thing coming out of this crisis. Governments are now lenders, investors, insurers, and borrowers of last resort for the financial system. And in many instances, they're owners of non-industrial corporations because of the way the crisis is playing out. In short, what we've seen is a massive socialization of risk in the financial system and in global markets generally. In the short term, this may not be a miscalculation. It may not be a miscalculation given uncertainty and given the downside risks associated with the alternative of doing nothing or doing too little on the part of the state. But I think we now have to start talking and thinking about the end game. Where does this lead us to? What new balance are we working towards? What new social contract between market and state? And as we do so, we would best pay obeyance to the facts. It's best that we study empirical regularities over long periods of time as well as short. Study what has happened rather than what beliefs were be driven by realities rather than ideologies and try to find pragmatic solutions that can best work even if imperfectly. I think that has to be the approach. The whole game of competing beliefs has I think run its course and we are now in a world where the competing beliefs are a relatively sterile debate and what is more important is to observe the facts, learn from the facts, work out pragmatic solutions, keep adapting and improving them as we go on. So what are the key facts of the last 25 years? The first key fact is that the global market economy, including global financial markets, 
are good for your health. They are good for everyone's health, including the majority of emerging market economies. They have succeeded in a way that no past period of history has and no alternative system has in re reducing poverty on a massive scale, on leading to an increase in growth for societies as a whole, and then on allowing emerging countries to catch up with the leaders, with the rich countries, in a way that's never been seen before. And this has been seen most dramatically in the continental scale emerging economies of China and India. So that's the first fact. The global market economy and global financial markets, in other words, adherence to property rights and adherence to an open economy, have proved their worth. Second fact is that beliefs in market, fundamentalist beliefs or no-holds-barred beliefs in market efficiency have not been borne out in reality. It's not a bad assumption to make that people respond to incentives, they act in their own interests, or that market prices incorporate information about companies and economies. It's not a bad assumption to make. But imperfections in that assumption are now have now to be recognized as not just deviations from the norm, but themselves the norm. Imperfections in market efficiency are the norm, and they sometimes lead to sustained cycles of mispricing in markets, mispricing of risk, of herd behavior, and consequently speculative bubbles. We should regard that as the norm in the functioning, especially of the financial markets, and not a deviation. And that is how we got to where we are today. The crisis, therefore, is one of a failure of regulation. Not a failure of capitalism, but a failure of regulation that was premised on beliefs that were not supported by the facts. Premised on the belief that, first of all, each institution, particularly each bank, would look after its own risks in the interests of its shareholders. And second, that if they all do so, if they all do so individually, we need not worry about the risks of the system as a whole. Both of these premises have not been supported by the facts. So what, where does this, this lead us to as a tentative conclusion? First, I think we can conclude that the invisible hand of markets requires the visible hand of the regulator for them to work well and produce the benefits that are intended. Capitalism provides benefits that are superior to any alternative system where government plays a supporting role, not an encumbering role, but a supporting role of setting rules and acting as a referee, and very importantly, of being the stabilizer across the cycle of seeking to diffuse bubbles before it is too late. We've got to avoid polar solutions and avoid any idea that this is about Washington consensus versus some alternative. Find pragmatic solutions that can allow free markets to work within rules that all market participants accept and which can, can try to mitigate the buildup of excesses that will always be inherent in a free market system. But of the future of our prosperity depends equally on how governments coming out of the crisis disengage or exit from the crisis management roles that they have taken. In particular, the very large ownership and guarantees that they have been forced to make because of the crisis, and the very large public debts that they have been forced to incur because of the crisis. There is, for a start, a problem of sustainability. Not many governments' balance sheets can carry the burden for very long. The burden of both substantial fiscal stimulus plus the use of public capital to rescue corporations. So we need a very clear plan for the raising of new revenues, clear plan for the cutback in spending, 
and you can't wait until the day that you run out of money before you articulate that plan because the markets will start judging you quite early. Plus, we need forward-looking government, government that looks beyond the crisis and beyond the cycle at public goods and in particular at provisions for human capital development that really lead to growth and lead to the ability of societies developing.